Okay, gents, moving on to the next big topic, US men's national team transfer update. It's been some big moves in January so far for Ricardo Pepe and Daryl DK. They both moved uh, to Europe from Major League Soccer. Um, a lot going on with the American players, so a breakdown what the likes of Christian Pulisic are up to, and then uh, look ahead to who else could maybe move in January. But the huge moves for those two players I mentioned, DK to West Bromwich Albion for close to $10 million for a team pushing for promotion to the Premier League from the Championship. And Ricardo Pepe to Augsburg, $20 million for the teenage striker. I mean, what do we make of these two moves, Nick Mendola? Because the US men's national team, they need forward players to find their form now in the World Cup year. That's been the one sort of Achilles heel area, hasn't it, up top for the USA? So these two young forwards finding decent homes, I'd argue, in Europe is a very good start to 2022 for Greg Bohart to sign. Yeah, the argue with wherever Pepe was going to go was a conversation of, Okay, well, what if he loses playing time before the World Cup, right? What if what if something doesn't go his way? I would argue that for the next couple of months, he's getting playing time he wouldn't have gotten in MLS. So I think both of these moves are definitely upward moves. They're not crazy. Um, we see that when you go to a club that is either struggling or in a lesser league, Josh Sargent, et cetera, that you can be effective in a negative manner. Uh, all that said, I like these moves because – they're going to give these guys immediate game time ahead of the World Cup qualifiers. They're going to challenge them at a higher level than they were currently being challenged in MLS, um, if only because of the pressure, maybe. And you can make some arguments about the championship from time to time, but the pressure uh, that DK is walking into there of trying to get a team back to the Premier League. So I like both of these moves. I think if they fail, um, there are ways and places for them to go. And the fact that the World Cup is in December and not in the following summer, I think the damage that could be done to their form for the U.S. is relatively limited. I agree with that. And Andy, to me, this seems very smart advice from their advisors or Greg Berhalter, whoever's helping out these two yeah. players. Like, OK, let's take your time and go somewhere where you're going to play regularly. You're going to develop your game. Uh, because Ricardo Pepe was linked with huge teams, Manchester United, Chelsea, Ajax. I mean. Bayern Munich, there was some massive teams reportedly in for him, but he's chosen Augsburg, a team battling relegation in the Bundesliga, and DK's chosen West Brom, who um, the perennial yo-yo club going up and down from the championship to the, the Premier League. So this is good, good landing spot. So I think you have to applaud these US players for maybe taking their time with these decisions and saying, you know what, I'm not going to go to one of the giants in Europe. I probably could, but I'm not going to play that often and I might get lost in the system. So um, yeah. th these are good moves, right, on the face of it. And obviously, we'll find out in the next few weeks and months how they worked out. But on paper, this is good for the U.S. men's national team to develop these young strikers. Yeah, I completely agree. It is very easy to go to a big club, especially as a young player, 18 or 21, as these two are, and get completely lost in the crowd. Things move very quick when you make that transition from MLS and you jump over to Europe. The game is going to speed up for both of these players. And so less so for DK because he's already been over in England for a half a season. He had the loan to Barnsley last season. He did very well for a time. I, th I think he, even more so than Pepe, should probably be applauded for making this decision because the talk initially when he got those first few games at Barnsley was, well, he could go play for Arsenal. He could go play for one of the big six teams. And we had those reports and rumors over the summer and it didn't happen. And maybe Orlando City and MLS lost some money on that because you know he was at a much higher uh, you know, selling potential at that point. And to only get, imagine this, to only get nine and a half million dollars for an American striker and people to kind of widely say, Wow, that's a really bad deal for for the, the selling club. Like that's not enough money just based on what the conversations were previously. So I, I think going to West Brom is is a perfect level for him. Uh, that championship level, it, I think that's somewhere that he could play for a really long time, even if he doesn't develop further. And I have some questions about whether he's going to be able to. He does a couple of things really, really well. Uh, the physicality that he brings to the field, uh, the hold up play, the aerial ability that he's got, but just about anything with the ball at his feet, I have really big questions. So I see him kind of as a late game substitute op uh, option for the U.S. men's national team. And Pepe, you know, if he goes and gets some games, scores a few goals, he's starting at the World Cup game one for the U.S. men's national team, assuming that we're there. We should probably keep saying that just so that we don't jinx anything at this point. But he he's the guy. He's the one that's been kind of preordained as 
this is the this is going to not just be the the next good or great number nine for the U.S. men's national team. Maybe the first one that we've ever really had. He's got a lot of developing to do, though. He's really, really clinical and good in front of goal. He's got the size and the strength to be a good holdup player. I don't think he has a full understanding, though, of how to do that. And so Augsburg, Augsburg I think, is, is one, a very good club for him to go to where he's going to be uh, in some really, really tough situations immediately. He's going to learn a lot quickly. But I think being in the Bundesliga as well is going to be huge especially for the U.S. men's national team, because what did we learn over the summer at the European Championships? All of international football now is a counterattacking game. It's all about pressing. It's all about winning the ball high up the field and countering. That is what he will see every single week in the Bundesliga, because almost every club plays with that style and that mentality. So he's going to learn a lot. And I think he's he's we're going to see a quick I think rapid ascent from him just in terms of his game growing. So I'm very excited for that. And the fact that these two move for $30 million combined between them, you know, I, I made the joke in the WhatsApp the other day, like it just, you know, this is, this is unheard of for two American forwards to move for that kind of money. Very hopeful. Uh, but, you know, being a little bit cautious as well. Definitely. I think, as you said, the number nine position is up for grab. Pepe probably has the shirt right now, but DK, Jordan Peefock, Josh Sargent, I mean, there's so many players there who need to find form and find it fast. The only issue I had with Pepe maybe is that Augsburg do not score a lot of goals. They're the fourth lowest goal scorers in the Bundesliga. So on one hand, the chances they're creating is he going to have uh, enough time in and around the box to finish those off. But on the other hand, they're going to have to rely on him heavily straight away. And he's going to be chucked in at the deep end, which I think will do uh, do him the world of good, I think, to progress this game. And we want all these young players to develop around uh, Europe from these uh, American players. And, and Andy, that moves me on to the next one. Which other U.S. men's national team players need to move? I know you're working on an article at ProSoccerTalkAndEmbassySports.com. That will be published, so you can read that over on the site about what January is looking like for, for big moves. Because we've had some reports of uh, Weston McKenney to Tottenham, Tyler Adams to Manchester United. There's, there's some U.S. players that need a move in January, right, to reignite their career, especially in a World Cup year. So who have you got your eye on? this month from a U.S. men's national team perspective? Yeah, I don't think either of those two need a move uh, before the World Cup. I, I think they can maybe improve their situations a little bit. Juventus in a kind of constant flux for the last couple of seasons. I think ultimately that gets figured out under Massimilio Allegri, but it might take another season. And then is Weston McKinney going to be in those plans? It, it would be nice to know that now. Tyler Adams, please stay where you are. That That's exactly where the U.S. men's national team wants him to be for the next <clears throat> the next 10 or so months to uh, to just hone exactly the role that he's going to play for the U.S. The player that I think needs to move the most, it might be Serginio Dest. And I know he's only six months into his time at Barcelona, but that situation is far worse than anybody, I, I think, really thought that it could get just because it's Barcelona. You see the name and you think, well, okay, Messi's not there. They'll figure something out. Like, it's Barcelona. They have to. And they simply have not, obviously, changing manager. And now they have Xavi in there. It doesn't seem like Dest is really his type of player. I, I wouldn't say that Dest is, is, is a Xavi type of player either. So I think opportunities are going to be limited once he's able to get in. Uh, if he's able to get in, maybe we should say, uh, some new players in January or in the summer. It just doesn't seem like a great situation. I think we knew that at the time, but we were so enamored with, wow, a young American player going to play for Barcelona, that maybe we look past that just a little bit. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be really interesting to see loan deals, potentially, what, what happens. Because a lot of U.S. players, I think, are going to be making moves now with one eye on later this year. It's it's a long time to the World Cup, and they need to get the wheels in motion to get themselves in the right position uh, to get into that squad, because there's a lot of competition for places. Nick Mendo, let's move on uh, and talk about Christian Pulisic because he started five games in a row in the Premier League for Chelsea, played the full 90 in each of those games. He's played in a plethora of positions, false nine, wing back, back as a winger, scored the goal against Liverpool. But how's he doing? Because I think it's been a mixed bag for him so far. And Thomas Tuchel's come out and said he needs to keep improving. That he, I still think he could be sharper and more clinical, but it's just great to see him back playing right after such an injury hit season after he had such a good start to the season. So what's your thoughts on Pulisic and where he's at mid-season at Chelsea right now? Well, it's funny because if you ask me specifically about Daryl DK, I would tell you I'm excited that this guy's going to a coach who knows him and wants him and is going to put him in a high-profile situation. But the opposite seems to be true. I feel like uh, Tuchel has graded Christian Pulisic, Pulisic on a curve uh, and not a good curve. It's, oh, I know this guy. I helped give him his start and – 
listen, I think he's a very good player who is almost constantly being used in his non-preferred position, and that's fine, but you should be grading him on a different kind of curve than, oh, what he's doing for what we are asking him to do. I think what's fortunate is he has reached a point because of what we've seen with the United States men's national team over the years that I'm not worried about how he's going to produce for the U.S. when he puts that shirt on anymore. But whether or not he's going to end up being so frustrated from not necessarily his treatment at Chelsea, but he is in his prime now. He's 23 years old. There's an argument that he's going to get, you know, better over the next year and a half, but he's in that prime, you would call it, for an attacking player. And I just want to see him used uh, in a similar fashion to what he's being used at for the U.S. So I'm glad he's being used. I'm glad that he's healthy. But uh, it's just disappointing to see him constantly being used out of position, especially considering that most of, as we pointed out, most of Chelsea's attackers are being asked to do things that they uh, that they don't want to do. And so, uh, yes, you have to do your job, but your window is very short, and I want him at his very best going into a World Cup, not in a, well, now I get to do what I want to do because I'm freed from the shackles, so to speak. So, you know, I, I think it's a mis mixed bag. I don't think it's really going to affect him in a U.S. shirt. I just wish he was being optimized. Definitely. And I think he spoke after the game against Liverpool, obviously a lovely finish, but he missed a big chance early and just looks like he maybe is lacking a bit of confidence, Andy, after being chopped and changed and asked to play in a false nine. And of course it was due to injuries and illness for Chelsea. So it wasn't an ideal situation for him, but he dug deep and was playing as a wing back, trying his best to defend. And we all know that's not his best position, but the point Nick just made there about him being optimized and playing in the right... Is there a discussion here that maybe Pulisic should be, maybe not in January, but in the summer, looking at maybe moving on elsewhere to say, you know what, it's been good at Chelsea, but I need to go somewhere where I am the main man and I'm not just playing back up to, to Mason Mount or other forwards at Chelsea. So is will we getting ahead of ourselves there or should we just be happy that he's been playing regularly in the Premier League? Yeah, I don't think it's quite there. I think we should be happy that he's played for about a month straight and hasn't picked up an injury. Uh, I'm knocking on wood here. Uh, you know, don't let that change. But he appears to have found, uh, one, just have healed fully. And I think that's something that he's probably not done a ton because players are constantly rushing to get back as soon as they can, maybe a week or a game a little bit too early. In a previous segment this week, we talked about Romelu Lukaku and Thomas Tuchel and how it's Tuchel's team and he should have the authority and, and he can do whatever he wants. I kind of want to take that back now because now that I'm thinking down, well, but I'm thinking down the squad, how many players are not being optimized? And I think that's a great word for Nick to use to talk about Pulisic, to talk about Lukaku, to talk about Werner, to talk about Havertz. A lot of these players maybe are not being optimized in their best position to give best individual performances mm -hmm. to the collective that is the team. I think there's a way to fit a lot of those players onto the field in ways that do optimize them. And it does seem a little bit like Tuchel is a little bit, I don't know, hesitant, if that's the word, or just simply refusing to do so because he has his ideas, his ideas are best, and that's what we're going to do. There's a lot of really talented, really expensive players at Chelsea, and none of them are being played quite exactly how you would think that's what this player does best, and Christian Pulisic is one of them. So Tuchel, you know, maybe just maybe maybe clear off the, the tactics board and just put something completely new up there. Maybe throw them up there and see where the magnets land on the board and wherever they land. That's what we're going to – it does seem, though, like he's making it a little bit more difficult than it needs to be tactically, but also with the man management, the situations, and, and the unhappiness that he's creating within that team. Yeah, it seems there's a lot of players for the same positions at Chelsea, and it's difficult to keep everyone happy, especially with so many big superstars. But Christian Pulisic, we're happy to see him fit, playing, got a big goal against Liverpool. So let's see if that gives him the confidence to kick on in the second half of the season. And remember, head over to Pro Soccer Talk on mbcsports.com for the latest U.S. men's national team news. We've got World Cup qualifiers coming up in January. We'll have analysis and all of that. We'll have power rankings of the player pool and who sits where throughout 2022 because even though they were at the start of the year this is a world cup year lads and with our partners at telemundo spanish language partners they'll have all of the live streams and a uh, bit ability to watch those games so we're really looking forward to what will be a huge world cup fingers crossed the us will be there and fingers crossed pulisic and co will have a very good competition 
Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.